Next on Startup, we head to Washington, D.C. to meet with Ethel, who created Doggy Washerette, a self-serve dog grooming service that caught the attention of the Washington Post. Then we swing by Chicago, Illinois to meet with Nick, the owner of Real Kitchen, the carry-out restaurant concept that's taken all the work out of preparing a healthy and affordable meal. And last, we stop in Cleveland, Ohio to meet with Jason, who started Cleveland Art, a company that turns one man's trash into another man's treasure. Be sure to join us next time on Startup. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. In Walsh College's business launch entrepreneurial community, consultants provide advice to aspiring business starters. More information available online. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. My name is Gary Bredo, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and an entrepreneur. The economy is in less than perfect shape, and when the jobs go away, there's nothing left to do but get up and get creative. And there are people all over America doing just that. It's estimated that up to 85% of new businesses fail. So I'm going coast to coast to hear the personal stories of the people who beat the odds and started a successful business from the ground up. This is Startup. I'm on Georgia Street in Washington, DC, and we're gonna to talk to Ethel who created Doggy Washerette. Now, although Ethel had no previous business experience and didn't even own a dog, she created this self-serve dog washing business that's making headlines all over DC. Let's go hear her story. Even with the overall economic recovery taking longer than expected, annual revenue growth in pet products and services is estimated to be at 4.4% through 2016. As of 2012, pet products are a $50 billion a year industry, and the market doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. Ethel always dreamed of owning her own business, so when the space opened up right around the corner from her house, she seized the opportunity and opened up a unique self-serve dog wash concept. I wanna know about you as a person. Tell me who you are. I was born in Virginia. Um, my mother was a single mother, uh, widowed at 40 with eight children between 21 and two years old. And my mother at that point was, I guess you'd say, kind of tired. <laughs> so she was right, like, yeah. you know, you, you know what to do, just live your life. So I, I um, got married, became a single mother not too long after that um, and divorced. And, and then I worked for the post office. So I carried mail and raised my son um, till he was 10 and then I remarried my present husband now 14 years. And then brings up to us up to 2010. Okay. January 1st, you know, the first day of the year, you're just saying, maybe this is my year to do something. My sister um, gave me the idea about the self-serve. She took me to a place where she washes her large Rottweilers. And I kind of put that on the back burner. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. pretty cool, you know, never heard of anything like that. I had um, left the post office. I had a little 401k, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, surf the web and I find the K9000. And I said, I can do that self-serve thing with the K9000. Then the niche um, is the, the grooming tables. See, mm -hmm. nobody else really offers the professional equipment to their customers. That's where my heart is, just teaching people how to properly care for their dog. So these machines do not look cheap. Uh, what does one of these cost, roughly? Well, when I bought them, they were roughly 18000 Each? Yes. Wow. Yes. That is a lot. Yeah, they were 18000 each. Tell me about the financing and how you were able what, to get yeah. the funding for what, this. What I did is I, I, I cleared off a credit card. Okay. I cleared off a credit card that had the limit. And I just bought them on the credit card because it was the lowest interest rate. Really? It was, it was that, that credit card was very low in the interest rate and it was lower than going to a bank and getting their rate. So you put the rate. whole thing on a credit card? I put card. the whole machine, both machines you. on a credit card. From the time that you made the decision, you found the K9000. I, I wanna hear about that time in your life. Did it, was it at that point aggressively pursuing a space? 
trying to find the right neighborhood. Where did where, yeah, how did you start? Yeah, well, I live in the neighborhood. I live five minutes away. Okay. And I've always thought it to be honorable to be able to start a business in your own neighborhood, your own community, yeah. with your own, you know, neighbors next door, you know, can come and, and people know you. You're the first business that we've done so far on the show that that's been all credit card finance. So yeah, that's yeah. cool and to the, hear. And then the rest was, of course, my 401k. Are you happy with the way that business is going? And what is your what is your favorite part of this business? It's all about the dog at the end of the day and, and the customer and the relationship being where it should be with them caring for them properly. So what's your dog's name here? This is Amos, Amos Catulli. Okay, and what, what is that? Latin, it means let's go Cubs. Okay, so this is a Chicago dog. Well, yeah, Chicago <laughs> dog. <laughs> Chicago Excellent. dad, anyway. Uh, have you been here before? Oh yeah, we, we're regulars here. We, I think we're one of her, Ethel's first customers. Really? Yeah, no, we've been coming about once a month. It's, it's really nice. I mean, she knows people by name. She knows the dogs by name. And you know, you just do sort of feel like you're in a little neighborhood business and that's great. We need more of that. Studies have shown pet ownership to be a healthy addition to your life. The constant, affectionate companion helps reduce stress and lower blood pressure. Tell me the story about Joy. My husband and I first, we decided, you know, well, we think it's time to get a dog. So I, I went on the internet and I started looking for, for dog poodles specifically. Yeah, sure. and, and I found a lady who was, um, who was listed as a rescue, Poodle Rescue. Mm -hmm. um, and when I called her, she said, well, I don't have anybody through the actual rescue, but I'm fostering one of my friend's poodles who was left at the vet. The lady was a, an older lady, and Joy was a rambunctious puppy, as you can see, and she just could not keep up with her. Well, so when she told me to come see Joy, and I said, well, you know, I'm gonna come see Joy, and I saw Joy, and Joy paid me no mind. You know, she had five other dogs, and they were all over me, and Joy was just <laughs> running around like I wasn't there. So finally, in one of her passing by me, I, you know, I, I grabbed her and I said, do you wanna go home with me, you know? <laughs> Her mom was pink and her dad was purple? Is that <laughs> um, what it was? Actually, I did hear that she came from a family of show dogs. 68% of U.S. households own a pet. This equates to 82.5 million homes. That's a lot of pets. What did you find was your best uh, your most effective marketing uh, strategy? It really has been Yelp. 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 Um, First it, time we've heard that too, so. Okay, yeah, it really has been Yelp, and, and I couldn't afford Yelp's monthly <laughs> uh, uh, payments, yeah. but the free part of Yelp has been um, the most, it has brought in the most customers. What are some of the hardships that you've had to overcome, and how did that relate to where you are today? Well, well, truly, um, like I said, my mother being a single parent has mm -hmm. definitely had an impact. Um, me being a single parent at some point has definitely had an impact. Um, uh, but as far as, as how you choose to live your life, I mean, I feel like everything that we're really destined to do requires faith. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it's always outside of your comfort zone. It's always out of the box, you know, and it never makes sense. Even if this business folds tomorrow, mm -hmm. I gave it all I have, you know what I mean? I can, I can rest in that, you know what I mean? And, and that's how you have to live to, to really be fulfilled. Well, thank you so much for talking to us yeah, today. Good. This is an exciting business. When you have an idea that continues to keep you up at night, the only thing that you really need to do is follow your instincts and then take action. That's exactly what Ethel did. And it looks like this business is putting the wash into Washington, D.C. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Doggy Washer App. I'm on Clark and Montrose in Chicago, Illinois, and we're going to go talk to Nick, who started Real Kitchen. Nick is going to serve up his recipe for success and tell us how he started this new Chicago concept. Let's go find out what's cooking. The average American is spending approximately $900 on takeout food per year, with 9% saying that they order takeout daily, and another 38% admitting that they order takeout once a week. Nick knew that the busy lifestyle of many Chicago residents simply didn't allow the time to come home and cook healthy meals after a long day at work. 
So he decided to take all the work out of it and prepares home-cooked, affordable meals that can be picked up, heated up, and served. Tell us who you are and a little bit about your history, uh, education, anything personal that you can let us know about yourself. I went to college for neuroscience, so I have a, a bachelor's degree in neuroscience. And growing up my entire life, I uh, thought I wanted to be a brain surgeon. Oh, take the uh, easy way yeah, out. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I, but I, I kind of started to lose interest in the, in the science and the medicine part of things. I had started cooking a lot throughout college. The idea for, for Real Kitchen came up about two, two and a half years ago. Um, previous to this, I was a cook at Charlie Trotter's. I had the station that sort of was responsible for, for plating a lot of the main dishes, and, oh, wow. and it was my job to sort of organize people within the line. I kind of started to feel like maybe that wasn't the life for me. So I was looking for a way to kind of reconnect with my my roots in terms of food. And so that's, that's where this idea was born, the ability to create great food that people can enjoy at their leisure in their own home. What is exactly is it that you're doing at Real Kitchen? Um, you see our menu, and then you can choose what you want. You get it in a container, um, you take it home, and you heat it up at home whenever you're ready. <laughs> so it's the kind of food that you would cook if you were so inclined, but we do the hard work for you. How did you go about acquiring the, the, the capital. So they're this. principal investors in the business. We had a, a long lunch and sort of shared each of our thoughts on how we could develop a business and just really hit it off. Now at what point did you guys uh, put together your, I guess your digital brand, uh, website, social media, and, and what, I guess, what level of importance does that play in the business today? Um, so I actually built the website, I taught myself web really? design and designed the website myself, um, set up all the social media, Yelp, Still Twitter, the same site? all that, same site. Awesome. Um, the social media thing is huge. It is, it is our biggest, um, I think, driver of business. I love this place. It's one of my favorite places in the city. The best thing that's happened to my neighborhood, wow. um, coming here and getting the food that I would eat myself or cook myself right. in just a few minutes, have it warmed up, is pretty genius. The U.S. catering industry has over 10,000 companies with a combined annual revenue of over $7 billion. So I hear you make the meatloaf. Yep, I'm uh, the meatloaf guy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's all I know is That's the meatloaf. Meatloaf. Okay, I thought I'm a bachelor's in meatloaf. A so, yeah, so <laughs> kind of a Michigan. thrown together degree, mm -hmm. very compact. Yeah, okay. for sure. How do you feel about Nick as a person, as an employer? Oh, terrible. Uh, I can no, imagine. Just, <laughs> but, you guys uh, look horribly <laughs> unhappy. You can tell. Uh, no, it's good. Uh, I, I like it, and since I hadn't, it's my first foray into this sort of <laughs> stuff. It's just constantly informing. I'm still learning. But what do you think about the customers? What are their their, uh, what's their view and perspective on the food when you see them come in and leave? Um, I think most of them really like it. I think, I think yeah. honestly, there's some people that are hesitant because they hear takeout, and there's a lot of, i got to heat this up at home, but then once they have their first taste what do they or watch they it examine... It, put it in their mouth with a fork? Yeah, too? exactly. Jeez. I know. But it, you, you, I've seen a lot of people come in their first time, you talk them into it, yeah. and then they enjoy it. Because, I mean, that's it's a... qu quality that you're taking home with. So what do we have here? All right, so we're going to make a baked whitefish dish, very sort of Mediterranean flavor. Okay. Uh, simple chopped tomatoes, olives, capers, herbs, a little olive oil, uh, and this will be topped with garlic breadcrumbs, okay. and baked. Very, very simple. How often is this a dish that you prepare? Um, so our most People popular, our most popular dishes, we'll do probably uh, maybe five or six times a year. Okay. Uh, this oh, one, that's it. Yeah, I mean we have such a big yeah. catalog that we can, uh, yeah, you, you can you can perfect. change it up a lot. Huh? Exactly. Yeah, and that, you know well, that, that kind of format really keeps it uh, fresh for people. You know, it, it invites people in multiple times per week. Right. Nobody wants to get the same old thing every day. Exactly. So does that ever get difficult for you to keep changing it up so often? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. Um, hey, or just maybe, let's say, more labor intensive than, than having a set menu. Um, right. But you know, it's being a cook or in any profession is very repetitive. Um, so to, to be able to do something new and different every week is, is great. So we'll do a touch of olive oil on the fish. Okay. A little bit of salt. It's really just as simple as kind of spooning the topping on. 
Uh, so, and you can top it with some garlic breadcrumbs. All right, so I've, I've breaded this whitefish. How does it look? Uh, it looks delicious. And then it'll, you can set a timer here for about six minutes. That'll awesome. be all it takes, just a gentle bake. That's it? Mm -hmm. That's it. Simple. Okay, so are you are you kind of like half cooking things, or what are you? What... Uh, no, we're cooking everything pretty much to completion. So we'll, we'll cook fish. Uh, 90% of the way, such that when you reheat it at home, uh, it kind of finishes to be perfect. All right, so what do you say to some would-be entrepreneurs, startups out there that, that have an idea, not necessarily about you know food service in particular, but just getting out from under whatever job or situation that they're in that they're not happy with? Don't be uh, disillusioned by it's going to be easy and it's going to run the first day. I mean, it's a lot of hard work, but I think that I think that if you truly believe in something and it's just not a baseline terrible idea, you're yeah. going to make it happen. Well, thanks a lot for yeah. talking with us today. I'm very pleasure. inspirational. Thanks. thanks a lot. So when you start small and grow at a manageable pace, it gives you the time to really perfect your craft. Now, Nick focuses on quality food and fantastic customer service. With that business model, he's always going to have a full plate. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Real Kitchen. I'm just outside Cleveland, Ohio, and we're gonna to talk to Jason Ween, who created Cleveland Art. Now, although Jason says that he may have struggled a bit in school, he's at the top of his class when it comes to repurposing materials into beautiful art and antiques. Let's go find out how this guy went from garbage picking to selling to some of the top designers in the world. The furniture industry has morphed into a diverse and dynamic manufacturing sector. Custom makers are creating innovative pieces of furniture that combine everything from repurposed materials to new and modern designs. Jason Ween is a self-declared garbage picker whose artistic eye and reimagined furnishings caught the attention of popular international retail companies and is solidifying his place in the global design industry. So we're gonna start at the, at the very beginning. As a child, I have really bad dyslexia and school's really challenging for me. And my interest was always, from the beginning of time, junk. And um, as I got older, I started working on cars. I started buying and selling cars at the age of 13. I had an art teacher who just told me how sexy and beautiful and wonderful it was to be an artist. And he really inspired me to take my mechanical abilities into um, a career. This business evolved because I, I was um, um, too dumb to follow the rules in class, but too smart not to follow my own bliss. My, my first big break was I was buying from this guy named Winston Willis. And I'd bought some bathtubs from him, and on the front of his building had this beautiful wrought iron and these terracotta, which is baked clay urns. So I'm doing a demo salvage after I paid him $500 to disassemble the front of this building that was collapsing. And the historical society said, this is a historical building, you have to stop. So I go to Winston, I'm like, Winston, give me my $500 back. He said, oh, you have to pick something else out. So I see a room of old movie projectors. So I went to the library and took photographs of what I had and some photographs to auction houses and to movie prop studios. And I sold eight of the 14 projectors for $8,000 and I bought my first antique store. So where, where, did it, where did it go from there? Was the store successful and what was the progression? Well, well the store was successful at the time because mm -hmm. we had the real estate and was able to sell to bring it to another level. But Cleveland in the Midwest is a little bit conservative of an area. So we were forced to sell in New York and California. California was really foreign to me where, you know, New York, I, I feel like I'm from New York because I've spent so much time there. So I really had to do research, architectural digest, who's the hottest shops in LA, and we would send them photographs. And we had a following before we opened our store there. According to federal government trade laws, an antique is an item over 100 years old though many collectors describe items over 50 years old as vintage or collectible. Uh, where are we right now? What is this place? What are we going to be doing here today? Um, this is the Van Dorn Ironworks. What we're doing is we're salvaging the wood. The beams that we're salvaging were 1,500 to 2,000 year old trees, and all those trees were deforested, so we're getting the floor beams um, 
from the building out to turn and repurpose into furniture. All the pieces we do tell a story, and, yeah. that, and that's why people allow us to do what we do. What we do is archival. Our furniture will outlast a nuclear bomb and outlast probably humanity. We, we really, quite often people have a special project and they want a special table, and I'm like, listen, if you don't like it, you don't have to pay for it, and we'll build it. And they've always, I, I can't remember someone saying they didn't like something we build on speculation. So it's amazing when you see a ruin like this and you see the moss growing that the building really turns back to nature. Some of the things I really, we look for is these bubble joints, how they were made. Mm -hmm. These were probably made at the Van Doren Ironworks. We actually use these on our structures to build our tables. You just don't see fittings like this. We don't build fittings in America anymore. They're all been exported overseas. So when you see little interesting pieces like this, it really inspires me. If you, if you look up in the rafters where this space is open, yeah. there was originally flooring. You can still see where some of it is left. But in these big I-beams you see here were these big pine wooden beams. What makes a person want to do this with their life? It was an obsession as a child. It started um, by embarrassing my parents, walking the dog, picking bicycles out of the garbage, antiques lawn mowers, and it just evolved. When I was 16, I would take my dates to old abandoned buildings, and I was just obsessed with just getting little parts and pieces. And, and then um, one day I just started, um, I moved into the old White Motors truck factory as a workshop space. Um, at the time I was carving wood, and um, I just t took the old carts and just built furniture out of everything that was around. And as quick as we did it, people started buying it. We went to the New York flea market once in the early 90s and we did Versace and Prada showrooms because they loved our aesthetic so much. And we were really doing industrial before industrial was cool to do. I just loved it and I didn't have any money and so I just used old junk. But so. at the end of the day, you're just, you're just a maker at heart. I just love to build. I love the whole experience, it, you know, the organic experience of finding something and figuring out what you can do with it. and and. What, what it could be and to see the beauty in, in something that most people would, wouldn't look twice at. The, the greatest piece we built is usually the next piece that's going to come out. We, we have a really talented crew. Everyone's excited about what they do. Yeah. And it's always evolving and changing with the materials and figuring out better ways to do it. And it's just the evolutionary process. Uh, what is it that your, I guess, your business philosophy or the best piece of advice you could give to someone who is, uh, I'll say, uh, you know, not literally, but figuratively stuck in school? When you work for yourself, everything always needs to evolve and get better and change. And the day you stop evolving and changing is the day you should think about an exit strategy and getting out of business. Right. It's always a challenge. People always say, oh, you know, it must be great working for yourself and having your own business. And the first thing I say is, I hate my boss. He makes me work too much, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's you. So, and it's me, of course. But, you know, they, they call it work for a reason. Whatever you do, you have to really understand that what work means. The essence of work is working. No, no one's going to give you anything. And if your dreams are of doing nothing, better marry someone rich. Although it may have taken Jason a number of years to iron out his business, Cleveland Art is setting design trends all over the world. And it doesn't take a PhD to figure out that if you're doing what you love for a living, that's what really defines success. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Cleveland Art. Hi, I'm Scott Case, and we are in Washington, DC. So there's communities all across the country that are at various stages of developing their own startup culture and their startup communities. So one of the things that makes DC special as a community is that you've got a, a wide range of assets. You've got some of the best universities in the world. You've got the US government and all that comes with that, including policymakers and lobbyists. You've got K Street, which has a, a rich amount of capital and expertise in a wide range of industries, all of which that can come together to help support the growth of these companies. But the key asset 
asset that everyone needs to focus on is the entrepreneurs themselves. How do you find the best founders that have built their companies that are ahead of some others and those that are building their companies right now and bring them together? So places like 1776 and the programs that they put on help bring those entrepreneurs together and it's their leadership that helps build a very effective startup community. And we're seeing them in places like DC and Nashville and Dallas and Des Moines and Denver, Colorado, building their startup communities, and DC is one of the early shining stars of that process. Next time on Startup, we're going to New York City to talk to Helen, Derek, and Jan, who started Low & Sons, the unique carry-all bag company for travelers on the go. Then we stop in Detroit, Michigan to talk to Rob and Robert, who created Detroit Mercantile Company, a retail store that offers customers an authentic taste of Detroit culture. Then we head to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to talk to Judy and family, who started It's My Party Cakery, a bakery that puts a touch of art into every delicious dessert. Make sure to join us next time on Startup. Visit our website at startup-usa.com and like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. What what uh what do you call organic food? What did they call organic food in 1950? No idea. Food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. In Walsh College's business launch entrepreneurial community, consultants provide advice to aspiring business starters. More information available online. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country.